Thank you for joining us. I'm John Richter, president of Friends of the Jordan River Watershed. Friends of the Jordan is a conservation and environmental group located in northwest lower Michigan. The program you're about to see is on a subject that will affect every person in Michigan and something we all need to learn a lot more about before irreparable harm is done to our homes, communities, and environment. This subject is called fracking, or more accurately, deep shale slick water hydrologic fracking. It's a new method of extracting natural gas. A couple of years ago, after watching a commercial by T. Boone Pickens announcing vast reserves of natural gas right here in America, I was encouraged. At last, I thought, here was an abundant fossil fuel that burned cleaner than coal, could end our dependence on foreign oil, and provide good jobs for American workers. Then I learned about the devastating industrial scale process used to extract this natural gas, the effects it had on communities and the environment, and that it was being sold overseas. Now I'm not only discouraged, but alarmed. We have seen the environmental destruction fracking has caused in other states, and now it's come to Michigan. We think Michigan has far too much to lose by allowing this method of gas extraction to continue. But first we, under, we need to understand how fracking works and what its true costs are. A series of videos we have prepared are segments of a two-hour presentation by Dr. Anthony Ingrafia from Cornell University. Dr. Ingrafia is a world-renowned expert on natural gas extraction and provides us with a sound scientific explanation of fracking. This video should be well worth your time to watch. You can find much more information on this subject on our website at friendsofthejordan.org or another don'tfrackmichigan.org. Thanks for watching. When things got started three years ago in Pennsylvania, all the return fluids eventually went into an open lagoon or a large impoundment serving more than one pad. There has been a tendency recently for some companies, not all, to move to tank storage. That's good. The fluids go into the tank. Where do the gases go? Can't capture the gases. What comes back is not only liquid, it's gas. And that gas can't be stored in the tank. The fluids can, and they can settle out, and they can filter, and they can recycle, and they can reuse. That's all good. But that's relatively recent, and not all 74 companies are using best practices. So you're starting to tighten up your regulations. 19 new pages of regulations were approved for Pennsylvania, uh, Article 78. That's good. Another 100 pages, and you'll be there. How safe is safe? I started off by saying everybody in this room wants to leave here with a better understanding of whether this could potentially hurt me or help me. I made the statement that all this industrial activity that's going to take place over the next few decades here cannot improve your health. Okay, that's off the table. It might hurt your health, it might hurt your environment, it might hurt your pocketbook, or it can enrich you. You've got to decide whether the risks are worth it. What is safe enough? Can gas companies produce from Pennsylvania Marcellus Wells in a way that is sufficiently safe that it will not harm the environment or human health beyond an acceptable level, that will not change your pattern and style of life beyond an acceptable level, and will not cause undue economic harm beyond an acceptable level. If you know the answers to those questions, let me know. Those studies are now just starting to be done. Okay, so let's look at some of them. Professor Engelder, uh, the guy that did the studies at Penn State that predicted how much gas and how, much well, how many wells you have to drill, um, speaks frequently around Pennsylvania, up in New York, does the same thing I do, has a somewhat different perspective on things than I do, but that's okay. So he's encapsulated this whole problem of risk into a very narrow discussion. Too narrow for me, but I want to describe it to you. 
He says the major problem, the major impact on human health and the environment <coughs> comes from what he calls the meth-mud problem. That's methane migration and mud intrusion into groundwater. Now he's probably right that that's the most common kinds of problems. These are the dimmick kinds of problems. But that's not the only kind, but he wants to concentrate on those, so let's do that for a while because we can quantify the risks. He's actually tried to do that. So these are his slides, two, three slides. This one, and now this one. So he's done some research, and he concludes that there was a significant environmental impact in the state of Pennsylvania during drilling for Marcellus in the period January 2008 to August 2010, one time for every 150 wells drilled. Now, there's something good going on here. This is called quantifying risk. Uncertainty quantification. It's what engineers call it. You can't make rational decisions about cost-benefit analysis without having quantification of risk. What's the downside? If you know what the rate of the downside is, you associate a cost with that downside, and now you can start doing cost-benefit analysis. You see? Okay. So Professor Engelder has done us a service. He's done some research, and he, he doesn't want to talk about Dimmick. That's off the table. I don't know why. He doesn't want to talk about Dimmick. So he thinks there is a serious environmental impact one time for every 150 Marcellus wells. And then he goes on to say that that's a really good record. Well, I don't agree. I have the right to disagree. Uh, I'm an engineer, he's a scientist. And he's a structural geologist, I'm a fracture mechanic engineer. So I know about risk and fractures and, and factors of safety and uh, reliability estimates. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try to show you why I think that that's a very bad record. <clears throat> he then goes on to say, this is his, these are his words, that your Pennsylvania DEP has a mission and it's to provide the leadership to the industry to develop even better practices. Now, I'm, I'm trying to understand what he means by that, so help me here. Does that mean that the DEP should have the technology and the experts to develop the best practices for the most technologically advanced industry in the world? <laughs> I don't think that's what he means because obviously it's not the mission of the DEP to do research and development for the oil and gas industry. So what does he mean by DEP being leadership? I think what he means is they have to increase the fines. That's leadership, right? You would encourage the industry to develop better practices if you find them higher. I think that's what he means. I don't know, what do you think he means? And now he challenges the industry. He wants to improve not one significant environmental impact for every 150 wells. He wants them to get to one for every 500 wells in two years. Okay, so run the numbers. 120,000 wells. Okay, that's 240 significant environmental impacts. Is that acceptable? You make the choice. That's, hey, you're, you're citizens of Pennsylvania. I was just a football player once. Okay. <laughs> You got to you got to decide whether what's what's it going to cost the state of Pennsylvania to clean up 240 significant environmental impacts over 30 years. Maybe that's okay if his numbers are right. I say the challenge for the industry is to have one significant event every 50,000 wells. <laughs> so I was giving a talk like this last week, and somebody a guy works for FEMA and says that's absurd, Professor Ingrafia. <coughs> It's absurd. The industry could never do that. They can't see what's going on down there, so they can't inspect it, they can't maintain it, so things are going to go wrong. Okay, so I also work in the aerospace industry. Right, my undergraduate was aerospace, so half of my time has been working in rock mechanics down there, and the other half up there, aerospace. So there's a dictum in the aerospace industry. If you can't inspect it, you throw it out after its useful life is expended. Because if you can't maintain it, if you can't inspect it and maintain it, you shut it down and you start over again. So my response is, if the industry can't tell us that that well during its lifetime is going to maintain an acceptable level of safety, shut it in, shut it down, and drill another one. Keep them all young. That's what they do in aerospace. When you fly on a commercial jet aircraft, you're guaranteed there's a one in a million chance you're going to die on it. It's 
The federal, federal law says that. I hope you, now you know that. You should feel safer. You get on a jet airplane, there's a warrant. Federal law says you have to be guaranteed by the people that manufactured that airplane and maintain it that the probability of your dying is one in a million. And it turns out to be about one in 10 million. Why? Because they can inspect most of it. But you can't inspect every square inch of every aircraft. So the critical parts that can't be inspected, they're periodically replaced in order to maintain the risk. Okay? One last example of why I think the current rate of accidents is unacceptably high. So I'm going to talk about what's called a communal industry, common concept. A communal industry is one in which large segments of society participate, either voluntarily or involuntarily. Two classes of communal industries. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about one of each. <clears throat> so, a communal industry in which large segments of society voluntarily participate is getting on an airplane. You don't have to get on an airplane. You can take a bus, a train, or a car, or you can stay home. Or, you can choose to drive across a bridge or not. Every time you cross a bridge, it's a voluntary participation in the bridge industry. You ever think of it that way? You're a participant in that industry. Somebody had to build the bridge, somebody has to inspect it, somebody has to maintain it. There are federal laws that say for every steel bridge in the United States longer than 20 feet in span, that bridge has to be inspected every two years. And if it's found to be cracked or corroded, it has to be repaired or replaced in order to maintain a minimum acceptable level of risk. So here is the level of risk. Over an estimated average 75 year lifespan of a steel bridge of over 20 foot span in the United States, it has to be shown through experience or calculation that the probability of your dying crossing that bridge is two chances in 100 million. That can be calculated out. That's what I teach my students to do when I teach them advanced fracture mechanics at Cornell. How you do that calculation. What do you have to design into the bridge to make it fatigue and fracture resistant so that those odds are achieved. And if it turns out during an inspection that there is bigger crack than you thought or more corrosion than you thought, then by federal law you are obligated to repair or replace in order to maintain that level. <coughs> so, two and a hundred million. Let's go to the other communal industry, the one that we've been talking about all night, in which you are being forced to participate. You're in Pennsylvania. You're already participating in it. You are participating in the unconventional natural gas industry. So what's an acceptable level of risk? I don't think the acceptable level of risk should be two chances in 100 million that you're going to have a blowout. That's asking for too much. This is a man-made system. An unconventional national ga natural gas well is a partly man-made system. So let's do the numbers. This number means 99.999999% safe. That's the reliability index. 99 with six nines after it. So those of you who have thought about these things that think that 99.9 .9 is almost virtually true, means 99.9 .9 means there's one chance in a thousand of something being bad. That's what 99.9 .9 means. If you have 120,000 wells and you're 99.9% .9 reliable, you got 120 failures. Is that okay? You decide. I don't think so. But let's take the extreme case, which I do not advocate, but just for the purposes of academic exercise, let's suppose that we enforce that same level of engineering and technology reliability on the Marcellus gas play. And Professor Engelder estimates that there will be 400,000 wells over the entire Marcellus over 50 years. So how many major failures would we expect from 400,000 wells at that level of reliability? Fewer than one. We already got by that. We're already at one, one out of every, we're already at one for every 150 wells. That's 98.5% reliability. Now, if I were to ask you, is a grade of 98.5 good? You'd say, if my kids get it in high school, yeah. Right? And if I was 98.5% certain that I was going to win the New York or Pennsylvania lottery, wow. <laughs> See the big difference between 98.5 and 99.9? .9? That's the difference between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 150. When you have small numbers, that doesn't mean very much. But when you roll the dice 100,000 times, it means a lot. 
There's a big difference between 98.5 and 99.9 and 99.99 and 99.999. You've got to make the call. What's an acceptable level of risk? To do that, you've got to see the quantification of the things that can go wrong. We're just now beginning in Pennsylvania to be able to quantify the number of accidents per well, or the number of accidents per truck trip, or the number of accidents per um, million gallons of frac fluid. That stuff could have been modeled. We don't have to wait for the experience, your experience, to learn those things. They could have been predicted. Okay? And they can be predicted into the future and people should be predicting them. That's half of the equation. Here is the probability of things going wrong. Assign a cost to them. Compare that to the benefit cost. Here's the expense cost. Here's the benefit cost. Weigh them. You decide. So, bottom line. Then we can all go home. We have a lot farther to go home tonight than you do. When compared to conventional gas production, high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing from long laterals requires higher volumes of fracking fluids, produces higher volumes of liquid and solid waste, involves more spatially intense heavy industrial development, creates greater risk of accidents, spills, leakages, discharges, exposures to water and air. I hope to have proved that to you tonight by way of data, facts, engineering, science, and technology, and a couple of quips. <coughs> quips. But ultimately, you get to make the call.